dispersing. So we have the pre-dispersion, uh, and then we have the fine grinding fi um, or milling uh, with media, and that's the second part that we'll do at a later time. So just we're going to go through a quick introduction on who is VMA and the relationship to BYK. Uh, and then we're going to dive right into the dispersion process. Uh, we discuss the lab and production equipment capabilities VMA offers. And then we'll review some of the QC capabilities and the lab space that we have here in the U.S. and in Germany. And as you can already see right here on this picture, we cover everything from small laboratory scale pilot all the way up to production um, capabilities that, that we offer. So the company actually was founded in 1972 by this really beautiful couple on the top right, uh, Herman and Elke Getzmann. Herman is actually still involved in the business today. Um, he comes in once a week just to make sure that they still follow his design philosophy. The company is now run by his two sons, Christian and Martin. And they have about 100 employees worldwide. Um, in the U.S., we have had the exclusive distribution rights for uh, USA and Canada since 1988. And uh, big additives were the first ones to really bring over some of these original lab dispersers and had them throughout the big USA facilities. And then Dr. Peter at the time thought it would be a good idea to offer this to our customers. And that's when uh, big instruments actually added this on to the product portfolio. And we've been selling them in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, about four years ago, we also started to offer production scale equipment in North America. And that's also going really well. So they are known to make high-end dissolvers, bead mills, basket mills for the lab, pilot as well as uh, manufacturing areas. And they are known uh, that they make 40% of what they make is custom. So they're very versatile in how we they, they manufacture these instruments. And on the bottom right there, you can see the original Dispermat that was born in 1973. There are still customers that are using the same dispersers today uh, that just speaks for the quality of the motor. Um, the only thing that they replaced were the control boxes over the years, but they're still running the original brushless step motor technology that are known to be really quiet. So if you've ever worked on a dispromat, you would know uh, just how quiet they really are. Um, that's a big advantage, especially if you're working with them every day in the lab. So here's the company in Germany. Um, they have obviously manufacturing, a big design department. They have about 10 engineers just designing new dispromats and, and bead mills. Um, and we have also a really high-end uh, laboratory there for doing upscaling trials and just proof-of-concept uh, trials that we can bring our customers into. And, and in the U.S., we also have that capability up in Wallingford with our sister company, uh, Big USA. So uh, just a quick intro in, into the dispersion process. So we actually, it, it, came, it was derived out of, uh, the pigment area, and, and it's about dispersing and breaking up these binding forces that hold these pigments together. And there we differentiate between these organic pigments, inorganic pigments. We also have functional pigments. And then we also deal with special effect pigments, those metallics, silver dollar, and micas that are more difficult to disperse because you don't want to break them uh, destroy these particles, we, we have to do that a little bit differently than just the standard pigment. Uh, so, but these are the different pigment classes uh, that are being used to, the, uh, the, where the dispermats are being used uh, to break up these binding forces. And the whole idea is to really just improve the overall quality of the appearance. So that's gloss, transparency, uh, obviously color, tinctorial strength and cleanliness of shade among some of the attributes that we're trying to improve by properly dispersing these different pigments. Um, so also we are doing it because we want to improve our wetting of our additives or pigments that we're putting in, break up off the Vandermeer's forces. These are these invisible binding forces that, that hold these pigments, uh, these primary particles together in these clusters. And then um, we try to reduce them down to primary particle size ideally with the fine grinding or milling. Uh, that will also improve our color. Uh, we'll get better gloss. Overall appearance is improved. 
Um, we can save money because we use less pigment so that improves our efficiency. Also our cost, obviously, because we need less uh, raw materials, uh, better product consistency, our formulations are being improved. And that also will lead us to a more consistent particle size distribution, which also will give us much better upscale results if we want to go from lab space to pilot and then up to manufacturing. And that display panel that you see right there, that's the new C technology panel that will um, give you really mo the best capabilities to really go from lab up to manufacturing. So all the important indices or variables are being displayed and they can be used uh, to really upscale from lab to manufacturing space seamlessly. So here are some of the issues that we face if we improperly disperse our pigments. Obviously, uh, we could have a shift in our color and, and poor stability. Our pigments would flocculate, uh, sagging, leveling, settling out of our pigments. Again, reduce gloss levels or haze. Uh, and separation are some of these issues that come up uh, if we don't do a proper uh, dispersion of our pigments. So it's very critical in our dispersion uh, process that we, we, we want to have stability. So the more stable our process, the better the color and the less fading we experience over time. Brightness will obviously give us the best color. So we should achieve that with a really good dispersion process. Pigment size. Obviously, the smaller my particles, the better my transparency or color. And that also leads us to cost savings because we just put in less of the pigment. Uh, and if you go into production scale, that can be a lot of money. Uh, over time, the companies are saving by having a really good dispersion process in place. And then obviously, viscosity is really critical. Usually, the lower the viscosity, the better um, the process for dispersing uh, these particles, and it will give us better particle size distribution and uh, also faster processing times as well. If you're dealing with something really tasty, uh, that's sometimes very difficult to properly disperse that material. And again, if the viscosity is too low, similar to water, then we have difficulties putting in enough energy to really uh, break up these binding forces. So that process also will take longer. So we are always aiming for a sweet spot and usually anything between 2000 to 5000 is great. 10,000 is also really good. Uh, but anything between two and 10,000 usually is the optimum range for what we're looking for. Of course, some customers have different types of formulations and we are able to, with the right equipment choice, to really break up binding particles all the way up in the 100,000 center points range, uh, as long as the product is flowing freely. Um, if it's not flowing freely, it'd be very difficult to properly disperse, and it, it will take a lot longer um, with different methods to achieve that. Uh, so it's really critical to uh, remember that uh, when we are dispersing, we're not trying to destroy any particle. We are really only doing particle size reduction uh, by breaking up these van der Waal forces, these invisible magnetic forces, and these larger particles, we call them uh, clusters, we call them agglomerates, uh, are turned into aggregates with the uh, predispersion process. And then finally, if we go into the fine milling uh, step, that's when we actually do the reduction to the primary particles, which will be covered in a later presentation that's part two uh, of this seminar. And then really the shear forces are responsible for the separation. So in the case of predispersing, we have a Kyle's blade that those are these blades with the teeth on them and they will create enough shear really to break up these binding forces and reduce these agglomerates, these larger clusters down to the aggregate level. And then finally, we really need to always keep in mind that we have to choose the right additives to keep these particles uh, in a suspended state uh, and ensure that they don't flocculate back together. So here is a, is a slide just showing you the different types of pigment classes, just giving you an idea of the particle size and uh, what that looks like on the microscope. So this is a really good slide. It shows you the larger particle clusters. We call them agglomerates. These are, look, looks like these building blocks. 
and they are literally fused together with these Vanderbilt forces. And when we start the dispersion process or the pre-dispersion process, what we are trying to do is we're trying to really break up these forces from the agglomerates and turn them into aggregates. If we go, if we want to go and reduce the particle size from the aggregates down to the primary particle size, that's the step, uh, what we refer to as fine grinding or milling, where that happens. So in the first step in the predispersion uh, process, we're really trying to wet the solid particles and the, the mechanical breakdown of the glomerates down to the aggregate uh, level uh, is where that really happens. And then obviously, finally, if, if once you reach the prime particle size, you really want to start stabilizing them with the additives that I just mentioned. Um, this is a good visual showing you what happens. So at first we are wetting our pigment clusters and then we are using a cow's blade to pre-disperse and turn these agglomerates into aggregates. And then when we reach that right particle size, which is anywhere between 10 to 20 microns, that's kind of the threshold. Then we really need to start the milling. Um, and at the end, again, uh, we want to stabilize um, the mill base by using the right additives. So in this slide, you can see the uh, threshold here at what point you need to start using a bead mill versus a dissolver. So usually the threshold is 10 to 20 microns is when you should start using bead mills. The dissolver or the predispersion process no longer will give you enough shear force with the blade to really properly uh, break down these particles to the primary particle size. So Anything smaller than 10 to 20 microns is that, is that point when we really need to start the milling process with using uh, a bead mill. And you can see with the right uh, milling system, we can go down all the way to about sub 100 nanometers or sub 15 nanometers is easily possible. So we have a number of different instruments that can get us there. So on the pre-dispersion side where we need the dissolver, very important to remember is the tape speed we're looking to be in the range between 18 to 25 meters per second. That's the optimum dispersion window. And if we don't optimize that, let's say our tape speed is less than that, then we, are, we are, would take more time to disperse. And in some instances, we may never actually properly disperse our, our pigments, our slurry. So when we go find grinding or milling, the tape speed is between 10 to 16 meters per second. So that's the speed of our rotor or milling disc. And that's substantially less than what we have over in the pre-dispersion process. And there we identify three different types of media mills we offer. So we have the vertical bead mills, the APS system, what's called an air pressure system. It's like a pop mill. Uh, we have the basket mills with a tourist mill TML. And then horizontal bead mills uh, with our SL line for the lab space and then for manufacturing the RS line uh, for different uh, volumes. So it's really important um, when we look at um, choosing the proper blade, uh, always look at the diameter. So usually about one third to 50% of our vessel should be uh, the diameter of the blade and anything less or too big will not give us the proper predispersion effect. And there is something that we call the donut effect, and I'll explain that in a, in a minute here, that you can actually, it's a visual cue, what you see when you look inside of the container, um, how the dispersion process or the predispersion process, how well it's going. Uh, and you can see here, there is not one blade diameter or size that fits different parts. So, there is a range depending on the type of viscosity that you're dealing with. Our mill base, you have a range of, of blade diameters that you can use for different vessel sizes. So we'll share this presentation and then you can look at that slide, giving you a, a much better idea on what blade type to choose or diameter to choose for your vessel size. Um, before I mentioned 18 to 25 meters per second of optimum tape speed for the pre-dispersion process, this is calculated uh, with this formula right here. So you might want to write this down. Um, if you are trying to get meters per second, you want to divide the whole formula by 60 and express the diameter of your milling disc in meters. So if it's a 50 millimeter blade, it's 0 0.05. 
um, for example. And then you would divide, so you multiply pi times 0 0.05 for the 50 millimeter diameter blade times the RPM of, of the machine, let's say 5,000 RPMs. And then you divide everything by 60 and that will give you meters per second. Um, and that, there you should be between 18 to 25 meters per second to be in this optimum uh, dispersion window that we are looking for, uh, for for our process. So the donut effect, uh, it's really called this way. It looks like a donut. And you can see it right here. It's a nice picture. It shows you exactly what a properly uh, dispersed mill base, uh, what process looks like. So this is right now something in the 5,000 center point, point, point range. So if we're looking at, let's say, something close to water or very low viscosity, it's really difficult to get a donut, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're not dispersing. It just so happens that the donut would collapse automatically as soon as it's being created. In this case, we have really good viscosity range, and it's allowing us to actually see what's happening uh, but with that donut that's forming. So the donut effect is important. It's a visual cue. And here you can see right there at the edge of the blade, uh, that's actually where that particle size reduction or breakup of these Vanderbilt forces happens. Uh, and also on the bottom here, so this slide is missing some um, additional breakup of these particles on the bottom. So there's actually uh, some additional um, shear force that's being introduced to the mill base that would also break up the particles below the blade that is unfortunately not shown on this picture. Uh, here you can see a real image of a really optimum dissolver presentation. Uh, we are putting in about 21 meters, of second, uh, meters per second, 850 watts of energy. And it shows you sorry, how nice that donut looks. If we go and look at this picture, that's really an improperly prepared dissolver batch. We're still putting in the same tape speed, but only 320 watts of energy. That means our viscosity is very low. So we're not putting in enough energy, even though we're running the right tape speed, causing us not to properly disperse. So it would be recommended that in, in the formulation process to increase the viscosity somewhat to have higher viscosity that allows us to put in more energy. Um, that will improve our dispersion process quite a bit. And then we have the case where we have so much energy we're putting in, there's a really thick batch and we hardly see a donut at all. This is where products are very pasty or really thick. Uh, so in this case, it'd be advisable if there is a way to reduce the viscosity of the product uh, that will allow us to get a better looking donut. Um, so this is a, doesn't mean necessarily it won't disperse, but it's a little bit more difficult to uh, disperse, the, uh, break up the binding forces because the viscosity is just really, really high. And in this case, we just don't see a donut effect at all. So this is just a slide showing you the calculation of the energy we are putting in. So that's two times pi times revolution RPM times the torque, uh, which is an indirect measurement of your product viscosity. And actually on uh, some of our higher end machines with the C technology, the control panel that I showed you earlier, you can actually, it actually measures the torque value and it's on the display. So that's sometimes really helpful, uh, especially in R&D, um, or if you go upscale and try to go into manufacturing, that is always very helpful, how much energy I'm really putting into uh, my mill base. So it's very important in order for us to optimize uh, the dispersion result, we are looking at the duration of the pre-dispersion, usually between 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the type of mill base or type of pigment. Uh, we always wanna see a donut effect that's preferred. Again, tip speed, really important, 18 to 25 meters per second. Uh, keep in mind what we talked earlier, the right blade diameter to vessel diameter. That's critical. If your blade diameter is too small, you may not get a donut and it may not properly disperse because you're not putting in enough energy. Or if it's too big, 
the opposite could happen and you might not get a good flow of your product in, in, in the container. Um, there's also many different types of impeller discs available on the market. Um, some customers prefer some with additional teeth uh, in the middle. So there's many different plates. There's also incline plates. So if you go on our website, you can see there is an array of different types of impeller discs that we offer in, ma in, in many different sizes. Um, obviously, the amount of mill base is critical. We don't want to fill up the container 100%, so we would have a lot of issue with spilling the material. So we're always aiming for about 50 to 70% of fill rate. Um, pigment and filler concentration is important. Uh, we want to keep the temperature as low as possible. Um, of course, if we are dealing with solvents, that's really critical. If we heat up the product, it could be dangerous. So therefore, we offer double jacketed vessels that allow you to really maintain a certain temperature with the right chiller setup. Uh, we're actually working with Chilabo, the excellent supply of heaters and chillers. And they have really good uh, combination to work with our dispersers. So if you have questions about chilling or chillers, we can help you there as well and give you some good recommendations. And then at the end, obviously, the choice of the additives is important to improve our wetting, uh, dispersing, and no flocculation of the pigment. And once we optimize all that, then we are ready to do the milling if we want to go down to the primary particle size. So here's the kind of the difference, obviously, with the dissolver, with, with the cow's blade on it. I have only limited amount of energy I can put into my mill base, limited shear force. And it's really only to deagglomerate and turn these larger clusters into the aggregate level. Um, it doesn't break them down to the primary particle size. So for that, we do need to do the milling. But it is an, an important step for any dispersion process. So you can't just go and take your mill base and before you pre-disperse and say I'm going to start milling because the issue there would be that depending on the milling system that you use you, you probably clog up the screen or a dynamic gap and that will cause other issues so you always have to pre-disperse before you actually start to mill uh, and obviously the, visually the product that you would have just pre-dispersing and not milling would not be as beautiful or nice is something that you would properly mill. So the color is affected by gloss. Some of the uh, attributes we covered earlier are affected by just using a dissolver and not milling. When we are milling, we can put in a lot more energy. We have these beads, uh, depending on the size, with the kinetic energy. It really helps us break everything down to primary particle size. Um, and it gives us a much better looking product. We already covered that earlier, but basically particle size, the smaller the particle size, the better my color, transparency, uh, and usually also I get a more uniform and nicer particle size distribution when I'm using a BBL. Um, here are some examples of different types of dispersers. Um, one thing that if you're not familiar with, uh, VMA Getsman dispersers or dispermats offer is that modularity. So this actually is the model AE, it's our flagship model. Uh, that can be used for upscaling from lab to pilot to manufacturing that has that C controller on there, allows you to send the data over to a computer, watch the entire dispersion process in real time. But it also gives you the ability to attach different uh, attachments onto the disperser. So here you have just the cowl's blade on it, but if you like to add a basket mill or a bead mill, or a vacuum system, or a wall scraping system, or even a rotor stator, you just open that clamping ring on top, turn that whole assembly, that shaft assembly 180 degrees, it comes out, and then you just replace it um, with a different um, attachment. So we can turn a dispermat into obviously an, an homogenizer by attaching a propeller or butterfly tool onto it, uh, we can use it as a rotor stator, again, by the, with that rotor stator attachment, or just as a simple disperser uh, where we can use a cowl split or we add a milling disc or a basket mill to do our grinding. So that uh, the system is very versatile. And here you can see there's a great slide showing you one dispermat has the ability to do many, many different things uh, depending on the application. 
if you're only looking to disperse or mill, or if you want to do something on the vacuum, we have customers, for example, that buy these to help them uh, process adhesives. Uh, so with the vacuum chamber, that's easily done. We also offer systems with wall scraping units integrated into the vacuum chamber called the Dispermat VL. So there's a lot of different options uh, that we offer. Uh, but at the end of the day, you buy one Dispermat, you can use it for many different applications. So that's one of the big advantages of using the technology. So the entry level model, the LC line, I think LC comes from low cost. Uh, but that's a very simple labs scale disperser. I'm not a huge fan of it. The simple reason is if you look at the motor on the side, the flange, there is a lever that is used to, uh, to actually move the motor up and down that stand and so raise the shaft up and down. Uh, I don't like it because it's manual. If you want to oscillate your, uh, the shaft or the blade in the container, uh, it's more difficult to do it manually. So we have a model, the CV, which is kind of a, our bread and butter instrument for the lab space that has the electric up and down. That's an excellent uh, machine for the lab space. Again, very modular, like what I showed you before. It also records temperature, uh, timer function, and the torque reading. So that's an indirect measurement of your viscosity. And it's displayed as a percentage of torque. And it's um, a lab scale model, runs on uh, 115 or 230 volt, depending on the model that you choose. We offer both options. Um, very quiet again, uses that brushless step motor technology. Uh, I don't know if you, when you were at the American Coding Show, we had one on display, and customers couldn't believe how quiet they really are. I mean, if you run them at five, 6,000 RPM, you hardly know that they're even running. Um, the next model series we offer is the CN. The great thing about the CN, it's also lab scale, but we can go all the way up to uh, pilot scale, 150 liter of product, and stay within the same model range. Uh, that one also has that automatic up and down. And one thing I want to mention, uh, we also have the safety devices. So that basically is a upper and lower threshold that we can manually set on the display panel right here to set a threshold for what we call the working area. So when you're running the disperser, the blade is in between the two thresholds that you can set, then you are safe to operate. The moment somebody were to lift up the blade while the machine is running and it crosses that threshold, the machine would automatically shut off uh, to ensure that there is no moving blade outside of the container. Uh, you don't want somebody getting injured with a high spin blade or have product fly around the laboratory, or also you don't want somebody just to lower it to the point where it hits the bottom of the container. Uh, therefore, you can set those two thresholds. And on the CN line, I can do it digitally uh, on the control panel. And on the previous models, I, it's done manually on the side with that slider. Uh, that you can see there below the motor on the shaft piece, oh, sorry, on the stand piece, there's this little uh, rectangular slider uh, that's secured with an Allen key, and you can move that up and down to set the threshold uh, of the, what we call that working area. Uh, also, the container clamping system, uh, it's really good uh, way to protect the operator to ensure that the container is always secured and always in the middle. Uh, so once somebody, if somebody were to loosen the container clamp with that wheel on the right hand side, uh, that means once it's, once there's not enough pressure to hold the container, uh, the machine would show you on the display and it would also shut off to ensure that the containers are always fully secured and locked in. Uh, what you don't want to have happen is a wiggling container and you're running this at 20,000 RPMs and the blade hit the side of the container wall. Metal on metal is never a good idea. And when you're running with solvents, that's a really bad idea. So therefore, this safety feature will protect you from tipping over a container or ensuring that the blade will never get in touch with your container wall. Again, this model also will show you a percentage of torque, speed, temperature, and timer function. And again, it has that modularity to change it over to a bead mill or a basket mill or a rotor stator if you want it 
uh, use it for fine grinding or homogenization or emulsifying uh, purposes. Uh, then we have also, this is the same model, just larger. That's more of a pilot scale. Same idea. We also offer the containers, single wall or double wall. And you can see the larger model comes already with the cover to ensure that nobody can stick their hands in it, um, get hurt by the, the large blade. We also have a product feeding port on top of that cover that you can open. There is a grate inside, so you can stick your hand in it. Uh, but you ha have the ability to add more product or look inside uh, what's going on. And there's also a light uh, that shows you the dispersion uh, process uh, during operation. So to make sure you don't always have to lift up the cover and look inside uh, what's going on. And again, this is the AE. That's our premium line. We also offer that all the way up to manufacturing scale, uh, to pilot scale. Um, this has the ability to store data give batches a name, you can store uh, individual trials by, by trial ID or product number. And later on, when you want to recall it, you can reproduce the process exactly the same way again to ensure no information gets lost and it allows you the ultimate uh, reproducibility. Also, this is excellent for upscale because the values that you're storing and you're getting on the display are very important, just like the amount of energy you're putting in also, the tip speed, temperature, all these values are recorded. Also, uh, the, the diameter of your blade is recorded to ensure that you are always um, have the most important information stored and that you can use that for upscale. We also offer explosion-proof versions. So in case you have uh, requirements um, in your lab space that need the X version, we offer that, that as well. And that's the same model, except for me, pilot scale. Again, that comes with the cover, product feeding port, light switch. And again, also the pilot scale models are fully adaptable and you can buy a basket mill and change it out uh, just like on the smaller laptop models and turn that dispermat into a, a media mill. Um, here's an example of a much larger production scale version. We call it the Dispermat SC. Uh, they can go up to 2,000 liters of product. And we also offer, it's called a quick change system. So here you have the ability to also purchase basket mills or rotor state attachment, and then just change it as you need it. So if you want to produce a batch and you want to do the full process with one machine, pre-dispersing and milling, then here you have the capability of doing it. Uh, there is also the option to add a vacuum system. Some people like to remove air uh, for better product transfer, more efficient product transfer. And that is, is, a, is an option, as well as a wall scraping system is also an option to make sure that all the product is always pushed back into the middle of the container. And we also offer an explosion proof versions uh, for the SC model. Here is an example of the vacuum SC just closed. Uh, that allows us to get rid of all the foam. We can put in more energy, usually much pr faster product transfer from one container to another because all the air is gone. Uh, that leads to improved homogenizations, cost savings. Uh, there's different vacuum pumps that we offer where we can get them from different sources. Uh, and some customers actually like to add a nitrogen purging valve. So that's another option with this uh, setup. And then um, here is some different control options. So obviously we offer that C control package, uh, but you can have something very simple and manual for your production. Um, Dispermat, we just have your amperage displayed, you control the speed and the temperature function. So very easy to use. And then we have customers want to have a PLC controller that you program yourself and integrate, for example, a scale. Um, and that you can do everything with the PLC control uh, and tied into your uh, QC package. Um, the issue right now is, is that the lead times are ridiculously long uh, for the PLC, so they're over a year at the moment, um, and they're not getting any shorter. So we do suffer ser seriously with the supply chain bottlenecks, and especially on these control boards, that PLC control is a big issue at the moment. Um, 
here is an example of what you would see um, in terms of how you can control the process with the C control package. So you can actually program cutoff values. Let's say you don't want the temperature of your mill goes to exceed a certain point. Uh, you can set it. You can set a threshold or cutoff value, and then teach the machine or tell it to shut off once it reached the ADC or run with the reduced speed. Um, or put in a different amount of energy. That's also an option. Um, then you can, for example, give it a name. In this case, Blue One, and you can set up the trial. And you put in the RPMs, what the amount of energy. You can put in the uh, diameter of the blade what type of container you're using, the actual H1, H2, these are the thresholds that we talked earlier about the safety working area, um, and then the actual height of the blade inside of the container, you can lock that in. So that ensures that you always reproduce, that the process is always reproducible. And then these cutoff values I just explained, uh, also something you can program uh, under the same file and next time when you run it, you just recall that particular file. It does it exactly the same way. And then you can see everything in a graphical interface. We'll show you the trend lines of each of these variables. And if you were remote and you could dial into your PC, you would actually see it. If there is something happening, whether the temperature is going out of range, all of a sudden the torque is increasing um, or decreasing. So that's something that you'll be able to monitor remotely. And we are actually working on with the new Windows 10 that's coming out soon, we'll be able to send all the data to a cell phone and give you uh, the ability to control the dispersion process uh, remotely. Uh, we can also do a net calibration, power calibration with our dispermats that basically gives it an absolute zero value so it's not introducing any noise from the instrument. But because when the dispermat runs, even without product, obviously, it's moving the shaft, so there's energy that's being used to just run itself without product. By doing a net power calibration, we can completely reset all these values to a zero point so that you would know that the energy that is being used to produce your product is strictly that uh, of, of the process, not including the machine input. So that's what the net power calibration does. And here is an example. This is the older software, the Windows uh, 7, uh, that's going to be phased out, but just showing you what you would see on the PC uh, and how you could control the dispersion process. So you could run it, you could stop it, you would see all these parameters, and then the bottom in the middle right there, you see the graph. This one picture doesn't show the, the lines, but here you would see then a trend line for each of these values. Um, obviously, this is a little dated. Uh, they'll be replaced with that Windows 10 software, and it's going to look much sleeker uh, and a lot more modern than, than this uh, example right here. Uh, then we have a really nice lab in Germany with the, that capability. So we have customers uh, that either go and visit, especially our European customers. Um, they can do proof of concept or upscaling trials. Um, and we have obviously a nice lab in Wallingford, so we have some new equipment that's going to get put in there. Um, and we have also a horizontal machine, uh, the SL that you see right there, and also the new AE6, our flagship machine is also in there with all these different milling attachments and bead milling attachments, vacuum attachments. So we can do a lot of work in, in Wallingford, and the great thing, having that lab at Big USA allows us to really... Uh, leverage those synergies between our company, the instruments business, and the additives business. So we'll always have a chemist assisting us uh, doing the trial. And if the customer has questions or wants to know if there is different type of additives or any ways to improve the formulation, that we can use that know-how and really help you uh, process the material better, but also maybe have formulation improvements. So we don't want to just be a company that sells you hardware. We also want to sell you complete solutions uh, by integrating our additives um, colleagues and giving you really the best support that you need to have a superior product. Um, some customers like to come in, use it as a showroom, uh, and just review the latest milling and dispersing equipment. Um, so you're more than welcome to call us and come in. We're glad to have you visit. 
we're just set up a time for you to come in and we can do an actual trial. Uh, we can also use it as a training or similar location if you have more, um, several of, of you in your groups that you want to educate or train, we can set something up there as, as well. Um, and then uh, some customers like to really come in and use this facility as a scale up uh, for larger equipment. So uh, the great thing is with the Dispromat, we have an almost one to one upscale ratio. So really able to tell you whether something works on the basket or how well it would work on a production scale piece of equipment. Um, and so these are some of the benefits that we offer, bring to the table, and hope, hopefully we can see more, some of you up there visiting with us at our awesome facility in Wallingford. So that's it for today. Uh, I hope uh, this was informative. And if you have any questions, I will open it up to the group now. Thank you very much. Sherry, any questions? Um, I guess. Has any? They can certainly type them in the chat. Or maybe you covered everything so well that there aren't any questions at this time. Oh, wait, someone is typing. So let's just hold tight for a moment. Uh, there is, you mentioned that temperature should be as low as possible. Ideally, um, what we see, because especially this is more true when you're milling, uh, because you really tend to see the energy really affecting the temperature. And especially when you're dealing with solvent materials, you don't want to get the temperature up too high. It's affecting the product. So obviously, every formulation is different. Some, you know, outside of the pigment dispersing world, we have customers that use the dispermats for different products. Obviously, they want temperature, uh, but there's always a limit as to how high you want to go. But what we have seen is the lower the temperature, usually the better it is during the pre-dispersion process. That's why we also offer the jacketed uh, vessels. Tim, I hope that answered your question. I think we may have another one. Oh, yep, he said thank you. We may have another question coming in if we just want to wait a moment or two. How best to deal with hmm, fixotropic slurries? I think I said that. That's a great question. It comes up a lot. So really, you have only one choice. Um, either some fixotropic slurries are affected again by different temperatures, but mainly you will need a, a wall scraping unit to properly move the entire slurry around the container, push it in the middle, so you don't have any issues with it settling out on the container walls on the side of your... Uh, on the top, uh, where you sometimes, especially when you're medium milling with the basket mill, if the material is too thick, so drop it, you can see it sit there around these bars that hold the uh, basket mill in place. So a scraping system is always helpful in getting all the product um, moved properly. Or, or also we've seen it with uh, color concentrate sometimes in the plastic world, maybe a change in formulation. <laughs> But that's sometimes not always possible, but definitely that's another area that um, should be investigated. So we offer, we don't, I don't do those. Uh, my sister, uh, our colleagues at our sister company do those. And you can send us an email. We'll be glad to put in touch, but we do have those seminars. And Dean, we can also make sure, um, being that I have your information, that we'll I can send a message over to the Big USA team to get in touch with you then to let you know who's best to contact there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, to back to you, I, I think uh, Dean. Uh, 
we offer the, the scraping options for very small lab scale all the way up to manufacturing. So we have what's called an ASC system that you can, uh, it's a rotating platform with the scraper arm and you put the container in the, on the platform and it does a really good job uh, keeping the contain, container wall clean and, 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 and nice uh, that all the product is getting pushed into the middle. Yes, the, this webinar will be posted later. Uh, we'll have it on YouTube. Uh, and we will also send out a link uh, to the site. And also, uh, I think sure we'll try to post it on our own website as well. Yeah. But it'll definitely be on the YouTube page. Yeah. I guess we don't have any more questions. So I think there's someone typing. So oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so if increasing the RPM doesn't help with the dispersion, what is the next step? It really, it's about optimizing the process. So RPM is only one variable. Uh, let's review the type of blade we're using. Look at the container size and vessel, the diameter, the ratio of the blade. Um, what other is the what is the, what's the viscosity like uh, of the of the mill base? In some cases, maybe we have to really uh, look at imp formulation improvements. Uh, but uh, are we not getting the right particle size in the predispersion process? Is it taking too long? What is the type of pigment? What is the slurry type? We have uh, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, obviously, there's some customers that use it for battery development. Uh, 3D graphic media, uh, or just standard pigment. So to optimize the dispersion process, we look at all these different variables, what I mentioned earlier, the, the, the blade type, the, the diameter, the ratio to the vessel, um, the amount of energy we are putting into the mill base. Uh, so there's um, a number of areas that we can look at. Also, are we oscillating? Uh, if the viscosity is really high, sometimes it helps to oscillate the blade up and down. Um, also, one other area I would discovered that recently. So, some we got a call in from the customer and they say we can't disperse the material with your blade, and we are optimizing everything. Well, we went through everything, found out that the blade was mounted the wrong way. So there is also a blade direction. So if you look at the dispermat, it has a. Uh, VMA stamp on it that has to always point to the top. Uh, if that, if the diameter of the blade, if that's upside down, you can still mount it, but it may, it won't prop, give you a properly dispersing effect. So these are all areas that I would look at and review. Thank you, Andy. Um, there's another question. Do mills break particles or simply disperse them? Ideally, a milling is just the second process, second step in my dispersion process. So you don't want to ever destroy pigment uh, particles. It's not the idea. Actually, there, the, um, th there is a probability that when you have beads in your chain, when you have tight space, that some of the beads will crush the pigment uh, that they're getting in contact with, especially if it so happens that the pigment particle is in between two beads as they're colliding with each other. I will cover all that in the next part of the presentation. Uh, but the probability is relatively low because it's almost like the rubber duck syndrome uh, or phenomenon that you have in a bathtub. It sounds funny, but when you try to squeeze that rubber duck and catch it, the rubber duck always will escape uh, due to the uh, fluid dynamics. And you have the same happening inside of a bead mill. So as the beads collide together, uh, probably the pigment particle is pushed away. And exactly that pushing effect, what's happening, is causing the breakup of these forces. Uh, so we are not trying to destroy these particles. We're really just trying to break up these binding forces. Now, when you are dealing with metallic flakes or special effect flakes, 
there is a chance that you can actually literally destroy them because they're usually larger. And so we don't recommend that you mill them. Uh, but with pigments, this should not be an issue at all. Hope this answered your question. Um, so all of our milling equipment, uh, we offer the standards. So in our basket mill, we have a standard screen size of 0 0.5 millimeters, uh, allowing you to use 1 to 1.2 millimeter beads. Uh, so depending on how small uh, you want to go down, that's usually a good starting point. Um, obviously, if you want to go down into the nano range, we also have smaller screens down to 0 0.1 millimeter, allowing you to use 0 0.2 millimeter beads. And for some applications, we'll make custom screens even smaller. Uh, so really depending on what is the starting point and where are we going to end up. Uh, but for most applications, that 0.5 screen does a great job. Hope that answered your question. Yep. You got a thank you. So I think it did. Just looking to see if there's any, oh, there may be another question coming in. While that is coming in, um, just to reiterate that there will be a medium milling webinar on May 3rd. Um, oh, thank you, Dustin. Thank, thank you, you for much. the nice comment. And Thursday, if anybody is interested on our website, we do have a webinar coming up for our new benchtop color instrument, um, the Color 2 view. Um, as mentioned, that is on Thursday at 10 a.m., I believe, Eastern Standard Time, Eastern Daylight Time. Um, and that's on our website at big-instruments.com if you wanted to register for that if you haven't already. And are there any other questions at this time? I don't see any, so maybe we can give you back a couple minutes of your day. Um, but I thank everyone for attending. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. And um, we hope that you're able to attend again and feel free, as always, to um, reach out to any of us if you do have any questions or need to discuss dispersion um, further or need a demo um, or anything of that nature. We'd love to hear from you. Again, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to uh, join us today. Thank you.